worst rapper alive. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Big Mac's back on the mic like oops. Back on the horse, still jumping through hoops. I'm missing Lincoln Pink, I don't lip sync. Just to be clear, choking isn't my kink, but I do it anyway sometimes, I guess. Gotta laugh now, die later in my times of stress. I'm blessed, feeling good, charged up like a Hadouken. Mesdames et messieurs, garçons et filles, jokers of all ages, welcome to the worst wrestling podcast. You can find me every Saturday at 4.20 p.m. Eastern Standard Time exclusively on YouTube and Spotify. I am your host with the least, Jack Lusne, and this is a comedy fuel, grassroots, fan-driven wrestling podcast, and you guys, I want to be king of the jobbers. I want to be the Santino Morella of wrestling podcasts, and so I need your guys' help. I need your support. I need to hear from you guys. Uh, so if you guys want to send some questions to the show, you can hit me up on Twitter at Jack Lusne, or if you prefer something less public, go ahead and send some emails to worst sports channel at gmail.com. Today on the show, I really want to talk about AEW invading Toronto and especially the highlight, which was the Edge and Christian I quit match. But before we get to that, uh, there's a couple topics in the world of wrestling and some stuff in the WWE that I'll get to. First and foremost, Ronda Rousey in an 18-minute interview on Never Before Told with Maria Burns Ortiz brought out the flamethrower on WWE uh, saying, uh, you know, and I quote, how much of an absolute shit show it is at the WWE because they can't hold the story over my head and hold me hostage with my own career. I don't need anything from them and I don't intend on going back so I can say everything that I think and feel while everybody else is still held captive by their organization cannot. And I watched the whole interview for context because I feel like a lot of times, uh, you know, A lot of these reporter sites will watch an 18-minute interview, and out of that, you get 30 seconds. So I watched the entire 18 minutes, and this was even more unhinged, I thought, uh, and kind of out of nowhere, like a fucking RKO, than I even anticipated. Literally, I'm watching under two minutes. First question, is fighter beef real? And basically, Ronda says in the UFC, kind of, yes. And in WWE, no. Loved everyone there. Oh, except Bruce Pritchard and John Laurinaitis can go fuck themselves. Straight up. Like, just says says that right two minutes into the interview. Uh, and then, you know, a um, couple, said a couple other things. Like, some of the stuff I noted was, like, her favorite movie is Spirited Away. That's cool. Uh, she also talked about her concussion history being the reason for her retirement. Uh, which was uh, around 644 in the video, and then more WWE quotes, uh, the ones that uh, I kind of quoted there of how much an absolute shit show it is, blah, blah, blah. That was all around 654. So that's getting halfway into the interview close now. Um, But yeah, Uh, I also didn't realize she was left-handed because kind of towards the end of the video, they had her kind of signing some merch, which was like the weird announcement they kept alluding to, uh, which was kind of a shtick. Uh, But anyways... If you want more juicy details, which I imagine must be in her memoir, uh, you know, not a sponsor, not a promo. I don't do ads on this show, but I just want to say when I was watching the video, it said you could find the book at OurFightBook.com. It's Our Fight by Ronda Rousey. So if you want to read more, probably shit talking about the WWE, that's where you're going to find it. Speaking of shit talking. Goldberg is out here talking shit about Asuka for no reason, saying, oh, some chick beat my undefeated streak. Um, First of all, I think it's patently ridiculous that you would consider that even the same thing. Like, it's, first of all, I guess you could argue, A, it's male wrestler and female wrestler already. So you could say that he has the longest streak for a male wrestler still. 
Uh, but even then, it's like comparing WCW, which was a completely separate company, to NXT, which is like a, supposed to be a developmental brand, uh, is already like, again, apples to oranges. And then besides the fact that this is all in the field of professional wrestling, which is a work anyways, like, what the fuck are we even talking about here? I think the funniest thing that came out of this, honestly, was the old video of Triple H talking to NXT trainees and just shitting on Goldberg's entire career. Basically saying, like, if you're, if you got a poster if, uh, of a guy, if your hero is a guy who's, uh, you know, who's uh, done this for, like, about a year, was afforded every opportunity and fed guys along the way, a guy who can't wrestle longer than four minutes and takes time off for hangnails and headaches, just fucking roasted him. Uh, 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 speaking of roasted, we'll get into Monday Night Raw. Just a couple quick highlights. Uh, you know, I think it maybe my goldfish memory doesn't help. Uh, where it's like I watch Monday Night Raw, and by the time this show rolls around on Friday, uh, Saturday, it's like I've watched so much other shit that it kind of falls in the background. Uh, but I just wanted to talk about mostly. Cody clapping back and swearing, you know, uh, because the whole thing on online and the IWC, which sounds so official, but it's just the fucking internet. Uh, (laughs) People are basically saying, and, you know, there's all these reports of like, oh, there's backstage heat because The Rock's been swearing and a lot of these other wrestlers are asked to be PG and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, first of all, Cody came out and swore. Uh, I've seen other wrestlers do it too. I think to a certain degree, depending which level you're at, obviously you can swear in your promos. Uh, but what was even funnier to me was, uh, you know, the report. There's this report going around. I love when there's a report. It sounds so official. A report from WON, Wrestling Observer Newsletter, which honestly is literally just Dave Meltzer sitting in a room writing his opinion Uh, which he's been doing for a very long time, and kudos to him. The man knows more about wrestling history than I will ever forget, but it's purely speculative what he's doing. Shout out to him. Uh, But (laughs) it's just, uh, you know, it's really funny when The Rock tweets on on your report that this report is complete horseshit. So not only is he, you know, denigrating uh, literally your work, calling your sources antiquated and fake basically or non-existent um but then also just swearing to do so a little touch of irony on it i thought that was especially funny but also i'm like confused i'm genuinely confused so if you guys out there i love i know the internet loves to correct people so y'all can correct me if i'm wrong but my understanding was the the WWE shifted back to a 14A rating since 2022. Like, I remember that being announced and being a thing that, ooh, WWE's going back to 14A, and it didn't mean that they were going to go the route of AEW with, you know, blood, st- blood sport deathmatch style matches, but just the fact that they were going to have a little bit more of an adult style programming uh, you know, that's what I thought was, you know, basically the, the thing since 2022. So if I'm wrong about that, y'all just let me know in the comments. Cause like I said, I know, you know, I asked for engagement and fan questions and all this stuff, but it's like the, the one time I'm wrong about something, I'll, that's when I'll get 10 to 15 comments on my shit. So if I'm wrong about the fact that it's 14A, y'all come let me know in the comments. Uh, But the other, you know, the main event, uh, Becky Lynch versus Nia Jax, last woman standing. I thought it was a great match. Uh, You know, there were, uh, it finished basically with Nia hitting uh, a Samoan drop through the table and then hit the Annihilator. And there was a moment there where I legit thought like, okay, well, you know, maybe they are going to tell the story of, Nia Jax and Becky Lynch going into WrestleMania together. Maybe they do turn it into a triple threat match. That could be a possibility, but no. Becky rolls outside of the ring to survive, uh, and they basically work up to 
uh, the big apron spot where Becky hits the manhandle slam through the table and then finally hitting a leg drop off of the ladder through the announce table. That part was, though, like the way Nia Jax was selling was literally like cartoonish and almost comical the way she's like rolling around and then just kind of like falls and perfectly positions herself on the announce. I kind of, that kind of shit. You know, I'm like, okay, whatever. It is what it is. But, you know, it is funny anyways. But it was a great match, uh, and I enjoyed it. Uh, but then SmackDown, rolling around to SmackDown on Friday. Uh, Dirty Dom costing Rey Mysterio the match against Santos Escobar. Uh, showing up in the in the Rey mask. I, I just thought it was really funny that uh, Santos Escobar... Uh, off the distraction, hit a cleaner 619 that Dom's ever hit in his entire life, uh, and then ultimately won the match with a Phantom Driver, so that was a nice spot. Uh, I also love RKKO, this new tag team of Randy Orton and Kevin Owens uh, is right up my alley. Um, they basically set up the match for Pretty Deadly uh, versus RKKO next week. And KO, the stupid double punch spot is like, both hysterical, uh, but like patently silly at the same time. But I mean, it is what it is. Um, one thing I really loved, and I did see, uh, I had seen this online before I even watched the show because I watched it back in the morning. AJ Styles and LA Knight, the home invasion angle. Uh, I saw the comments about, you know, it was a little awkward and disjointed how it kind of starts for like, that 30 seconds were supposed to be like a WWE interview, but it's like midnight and AJ's house. So yeah, that didn't make a lot of sense. Literally, this is where it's like, it's such a small thing, but if you just change that from WWE camera interview to AJ phone interview and just, Hey, you know, he hears the thing outside and he hands the phone to his wife and now his wife's chasing him with the phone. And then, it would make sense that once they started fighting, she would turn the phone off and then it would switch to, okay, now actually we got the rest of this from the dash. So that's just like such a small detail, but uh, you know, they're doing so many good things lately. Um, like one thing, even I wanted to go back to actually on raw was they did the tracking camera shot, which was beautiful where they followed um what was his face? Sami Zayn uh, going through from the ring to the back and then it tracked through and then stopped at another conversation. That was like the next scene, uh, but all tracked in one shot. Like they're doing stuff in WWE now ever since the exodus of Vince McMahon and all his cronies, uh, you know, that I really love. And, you know, again, when they make a small mistake like this, I'm now more willing to forgive you know, that kind of thing when your overarching stories are trying to do better, right? It's like you can't expect them to be perfect all the time. The fact that they're trying and they're actually like doing things now that, you know, seem fresh and seem new, but staying within the mold of, you know, what pro wrestling has and will always be. Like, I really love a lot of, you know, what's been happening lately. Um, the one thing I, I got to say I did not love was the Roman and Cody promo to end SmackDown. This was some boring shit, if I'm being perfectly honest. Like, the highlight of this whole segment was the woman in the crowd who said to Roman Reigns, you really need a room full of people to acknowledge your bitch ass. She is the hero that we both deserve and need right now. This woman cut a better promo on Roman Reigns with one fucking line than Cody has in weeks. What is this shit? Uh, so that was hilarious to me. And, you know, they do the thing with kind of like almost the Avengers standoff. And I thought it was a missed opportunity because, yes... Cody outsmarting Roman Reigns in a sense by having Jay Uso and Seth Rollins actually there as backup. That's, you know, one way to play it. The way I thought would have been so much better is literally just replace those same two figures 
with Kevin Owens and Randy Orton. We literally saw Randy Orton sneak up on Pretty Deadly earlier in the night. Uh, you know, the way he sidles up. It's funny. He's like the guy, the butler from uh, from Mr. D's. Just sneaky, sneaky. Uh, that's Randy Orton just sidling up to people. But yeah, I would have liked to see Randy Orton sidle his way into this uh, with Kevin Owens. Because that would now show that actually Cody Rhodes at the end of the day has the numbers game in his favor, technically speaking. Because, yeah, you got the Rock has – sorry, you got Roman Reigns has the bloodline with Solo, Jimmy, and the Rock. That's four people. If you're introducing Randy and Kevin Owens into this equation now as the guys backing up Cody on SmackDown, and you have also Seth and Jay – backing him up on raw well now all of a sudden that's five and now you're talking about oh well hey you know you have the announcers play the shit out of it oh well cody's the one actually that has the numbers advantage now going into wrestlemania and so perhaps even if it is bloodline rules you know he's not totally screwed and so it it kind of protects him in a sense and keeps him strong whether he wins night one or two, uh, white night one or not. And I think it's like everybody knows at this point that you know the Rock and Roman are going to win night one somehow, some way to make this bloodline rules because this is going to be a clusterfuck of a match and a finish for WrestleMania night two. I'm expecting like full Avengers standoff. You know, my thought, wish, I've started to see it sniffed out, uh, you know, by some other accounts on the internet there in the IWC uh, that uh, Stone Cold could potentially come back and, you know, face off with his old rival, The Rock, and stand off on Cody's side of the Avengers line. Uh, but yeah, I'm really, you know, I think they're building that excitement, uh, but that's, I feel like you've lost a little bit of that intrigue by just having Jay and Seth show up instead. But I mean, again, with where they're going with everything and how much excitement there is for WrestleMania, I'm willing to, you know, suspend my disbelief uh, again to a little bit greater level maybe than I was willing to in the late stage Vince McMahon era. Uh, you know, I'm kind of, Again, not everything was perfect uh, in the days of the Attitude Era. In fact, a lot of things were terrible and, and imperfect. But, um, you know, the sense of excitement and the build and the highlights, that's kind of what kept it going through that era. And there is definitely some of that feeling and juice uh, around, you know, the bloodline and Cody Rhodes and The Rock. And you have the gravitas with the names and the family lineage and just the title and all of it is really, you know, building to this beautiful crescendo. Um, so I'm genuinely excited for WrestleMania. But yeah, felt like this SmackDown was maybe just a little bit of a let, let down and kind of a stepping stone. Uh, there definitely was a less less juice and electricity without The Rock there. Um, you know, The Rock's presence just elevates everything to another level. So uh, very excited to kind of see where they go with this and how we go to WrestleMania. AEW invaded Toronto. I'm not sure about the collision, honestly, but I didn't watch that. So I didn't review that. This is for the rampage and dynamite. Uh, mainly this is just edge versus Christian. I'm from Toronto, Ontario. That's my OG hometown. It's funny. Cause I feel like I have two hometowns. That's a separate story, but I am literally born and raised in Toronto, born in Etobicoke General Hospital, uh, which is just outside, well, not even outside, it's a suburb of Toronto, basically. Uh, but I grew up uh, Mount Pleasant in Eglinton, right in Toronto. Uh, so yeah, that's, <coughs> uh, and it's also where I went to college. So I, you know, Toronto for me is definitely one of the places I call home. Edge and Christian, two of my all-time favorites. Uh, you know, that I'll, I'll get more into kind of what that means to, you know, someone like myself. 
Um, but before I get into that, just uh, you know, running through some highlights of both shows uh, again, Rampage and Dynamite Mix. And this is not like a full crazy review. If you want one of those, there are way better sites than mine out there. This is the worst sports channel. Uh, you know, I love going in raw. Those uh, Steven Larson, uh, you know, are two guys that I really look up to uh, in terms of like the wrestling content. I love what they do. So shout out to those guys. Uh, also, obviously, shout out to Wei Ting and um, John. I'm forgetting his last name. Huge apologies. But, uh, you know, their uh, fellow Tor John Pollock, fellow Torontonians, uh, they do fantastic work as well. So love those guys. They were probably there, so their uh, review, highly, I would highly recommend. Uh, if you're a wrestling fan out there and somehow not listening to those guys you and you know listening to my Muppet ass, you should be. Uh, but yeah, just a couple quick highlights. I mean, obviously, Okada wins the AEW Continental title, whatever the fuck that is. Uh, but hey, he wins the title basically in his first match, so that was cool. Uh, you know, I really liked... Um, I really liked the main event of Rampage, the street fight with Willow Nightingale and Chris Statlander uh, versus uh, Sky Blue and Julia Hart. Uh, it's funny because it's like all I hear about is how much AEW doesn't value the women's division and how it's not that strong. And meanwhile, uh, I saw two tag matches, meaning eight women. And they were all great. Like, I, you know, Tony Storm and I forget the partner's name, but uh, against Diana Prazzo and uh, 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 Thunder Rosa. There it is. Jeez. Smoked a little bit too much reefer this morning. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so that, that was a good tag match. I really liked that match. Um, but then also, like I was saying, this main event was killer. Uh, and Sky Blue absolute mvp of this match hit the sunset flip bomb uh i think that's like her finisher the blue bomb or whatever the hell they call it uh hit it on the announce table to willow nightingale that was cool uh she hit statlander with i love that head scoop super kick in the corner shtick uh she hit that on statlander and then followed up with the power bomb into the tax uh and then uh the this was this shit honestly Maybe I don't watch like a lot of like death matches. Maybe I gotta get up to speed on my CZW. Uh, but putting the thumbtacks in the mouth, oh, that spot just made me cringe. And then you know, super kick the, to the to the Statlander like that was heavy. I mean, Statlander obviously taking some uh, huge bumps here, so she was awesome too. But uh, and then you know, Sky Blue took the Death Valley Driver from willow off the apron through the tables uh julia hart ended up winning with the submission uh when statlander missed the 450 on the trail so yeah statlander would have been like my second mvp but man it's, it's, i just i i guess i wasn't expecting it as much from sky blue uh it's like i knew statlander uh was kind of and uh willow nightingale were like more known for that kind of wrestling whereas like you know, seeing Sky Blue like do some of that shit to me was just like, oh shit. Uh, and then, uh, you know, some other highlights from again mixing both shows together because I watched them back to back, and honestly, they kind of just started to bleed in after a while. Which I think I'm actually gonna do a whole separate video on just like my feelings and thoughts on AEW as a whole uh, so far as a fan because. You know, ever since I started this podcast, I've been watching more diligently where it's like, you know, in the past, I would just kind of check in here and there. And so I didn't care as much about like the storylines and stuff. But I definitely have uh, stronger thoughts and opinions now that I've been watching a little bit more recurrently. Uh, but yes, sorry, very long winded, but on a short show today, uh, Hook beats Chris Jericho. I liked that. <laughs> Uh, I like anytime Chris Jericho doesn't go over the rising star. Uh, but you know, Jericho's pretty good for that. I think people give him shit a lot of times. Uh, and especially in AEW when he was first getting in and went, you know, had to win the title and like, you know, he was helping, he was like the first big name they had. He was helping carry the company to where it is today. So, you know, I, I still give Jericho his props. I know he's a little crazy in real life, but, 
it it is what it is. But Hook beats him, and then now you know beat him with a small, like a really good small package and a good hard fought match. Um, but then you know not only does Jericho give him the props, uh, he gives him the props after the fact. Uh, and you know it sets up an angle of I think they're gonna have like a tag match next week, or he's got some proposition for him, or ba ba ba, whatever it is. Uh, and then best friends uh, beat Hobbs and Kyle Fletcher. So like, m- b- bunch of different things about this match for me is like for one, Orange Cassidy. I get it. I understand why people. Some people don't like the shtick. But hey, this house here, we're freshly squeezed, my man. Uh, I got to tell you, my daughter is a huge fan of Orange Cassidy. I love Orange Cassidy. Orange Cassidy versus Pack at Revolution is one of our favorite matches. Uh, We like the comedy angle, so it is what it is. I know it's not for everybody, um, but I feel like he's kind of evolved it to, it. you know, it has longevity that I maybe didn't even expect, even though I was a fan of the whole shtick. Uh, but man, Kent Hobbs and Kyle Fletcher away from Don Callis. Just too much Don Callis. I'm so sick of Don Callis. I cannot take Don Callis anymore. This guy's got like five fucking people in his faction. And there's it's just too much. AEW is just too much of everything. Too many factions, too many fucking titles, too much Don Callis. But, man, that last one, Don Callis just has go-away heat with me. Like, it's not even, like, heel heat where it's like, ooh, this guy's fun to to boo. Like, no. As soon as I see him on my screen, I just immediately want to change the channel. So I'm just, I'm so over this Don Callis family. And it's like, the fact that he's got to come out with every single fucking member of the faction on three different matches of the, like the announcer even said at one point, like, is this the Don Callis hour? It's like, yeah, I felt that way. This guy was on my fucking TV screen more than the wrestlers. Like, it's just ridiculous. Get this, get this fucking guy out of here. Or at least just like limit the appearances to like one on the show. Like it was too, it was just too much. But the main event uh, of uh, Dynamite and the main event of this show, and I'm pulling out my phone here because I, I, you know, did full notes on the on this match. Uh, it was the Edge and Christian I Quit match for uh, the I think it's the AEW TNT title. Fuck, who cares? It's a title. <laughs> uh, I loved this match, and you know, I know there were definitely some thoughts and feelings about the match. I remember seeing a clip from Brian Alvarez talking about if you loved this main event, uh, you loved a WWE match. Uh, I'm assuming he was talking about this match because he didn't actually say it directly in the clip. Um, So if I'm wrong, you know, apologies to Brian Alvarez, but I, I disagree. Like, yes, there were definitely facets of what you could call a WWE match because Edge and Christian are professional workers that have been in the business for decades. So, yes, of course, some of their style, you could say, is what you would call traditional WWE. But I, where I disagree is when I watched the match, I was like, okay, yeah, they're working maybe a little bit of that style, but it's just so unfettered and uninhibited and having fun with it and just... You know, everything about it felt like, yeah, okay. It felt like all the best aspects of, you know, the WWE Attitude Era without the bullshit, honestly, is what it felt like to me anyways. Um, And there were so many highlights of this match. The ending, I was a little more lukewarm, but, you know, first of all, I kind of, Touched on it a little bit at the top of the show, but wrestling, one of the things I love about professional wrestling is that it is a truly international sport, uh, especially I feel like in this day and age uh, where, you know, the world of sports is often very USA centric. And obviously I understand why because of 
the amount of people, the ratings, the fandom. I get it, right? They're number one. But Canada especially has a rich wrestling culture. So does England and, you know, many other places in the world. But Canada is with Stampede Wrestling. You talk about the Heart Foundation. It goes all the way back. Um, and, you know, in Quebec, I can tell you that the wrestling roots here go deep. Uh, so I I think Edge versus Christian in Toronto honestly is as big a match to us. And when I say to us, I mean Canadian fans. I mean someone like myself, like I mentioned earlier, who's from Toronto. Like to me, Edge and Christian is just as big a match. Edge versus Christian, anytime, anywhere, any place. To me, that's as big a match as Rock Hogan. Like I know it's not the same, but again, it's I'm talking about what it means to me as a as a wrestling fan from. Toronto. And I know there's a lot of us out there. And I know there's a lot of just, you know, huge Edge and Christian fans out there. And one of the lamentations that I've seen is that AEW is turning into, you know, WCW or uh, turning into WWE Light, WWE if you ordered it from Wish, because you got all these old WWE guys coming in and these are the two that I honestly, I'm sorry, I give the exception to my guys, Edge and Christian. Beyond the fact that they're Canadian, um, it goes back, honestly, to the Edge and Christian pod of awesomeness. And I really wish uh, that that podcast wasn't defunct. I feel like the episodes are hard to find, harder to find nowadays. But man, that podcast was so funny and extremely enlightening uh, into the types of people that, you know, Christian and I keep calling him Edge. I'm going to just keep calling him Edge. I know it's Adam Copeland and technically it, to me, it's Edge and Christian. I'm just going to keep calling them that anyways. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like to just the types of people that they are in real life. Uh, and, you know, at that time, they really thought like their careers were over and you could hear it so often on the show, the, the passion and uh, you know, the kind of like the, the feeling of missing out uh, the FOMO that they had because they couldn't do what they loved and seeing them get to do that and it's one thing when Edge came back to WWE, and you know, I, I am almost glad Christian like didn't take that route because it fits his character even better. Uh, and you know, ended up fitting this story even better. But man, yeah, I'm just it it makes me happy to see them wrestling at this level in a company like AEW where they have the, the true freedom to, you know, really do what they feel is their best work. Uh, and I think regardless of what some idiot on the internet says, this was some of their best work. I think this was probably the best edge versus Christian match. Uh, and there's been a few of them, but this was, I think this was my favorite. Um, so just going through some of the highlights, uh, the hockey fight in the penalty box with the Toronto jersey and the Boston jersey was priceless. Uh, those fans had to be plants. If they weren't, that was like a miracle of happenstance. But I'm I'm betting those fans were supposed to be there wearing those specific jerseys to get them ripped off. But didn't matter to me. Edge ripping the Boston jersey off to put it on Christian was hilarious put the Toronto jersey on himself and then them fighting in the penalty box. Like it, that's just so classic. Um, and then they had a bunch of spots where, you know, and I kind of love that edge and Christian kind of get to do their work in AEW. Cause yeah, it kind of shows some of these other guys, you don't have to do a fucking three sixty swanton 20 feet off the ladder and absolutely kill yourself for the fans to be chanting. Uh, this is awesome. Like, you know, uh, they had the ladder spot set up between the ring bell area and the announce table. 
and Edge hit the inverted neck breaker. Uh, that was an amazing spot. Uh, they had the inverted ladder in the corner in the ring, and Edge hit a reverse suplex. That was an awesome spot. Uh, you know, they had all kinds of great spots, but honestly, out of all the spots they were doing, the shit that made me laugh the most was early in the match, the way they kept saying no to when the ref would ask them, like, do you quit? At one point, Edge goes, uh, I hate you, Christian. Never. <laughs> and then I was already laughing, and Christian topped it even more. Just he goes, uh, he's like kind of rolled over and something. He goes, I'm not a quitter like Toronto. Yeah, if you are a Leafs fan out there, that one hurt. I know it hurt you a little bit. I'm sorry, but that was fucking hysterical. And then just kept it up with the, the Canadian references using the hockey net at one point, uh, Edge hitting, like, the snake eyes and throwing Christian in the hockey net, uh, and then Christian cracking the hockey stick on on Edge's back. Uh, and then they were just bringing out everything, barbed wire, wrap chair, uh, you know, Christian threatening to do the concerto with the barbed wire chair, and then, uh, you know, Edge, uh, you know, reverses, and then at one point he's choking him with the hockey stick, and, like, all this shit's happening. And then the factions uh, get involved. And this is where I just, I struggle with AEW a little bit with like, you know, is it just me or does every motherfucker have to have a faction in this company? Uh, but Christian's faction comes out, kill switch. And this uh, Wayne Brady kid, I don't know his fucking name. Uh, and then the, the mama Brady or mama Wayne or whatever the fuck her name is. Uh, they're all out there. Uh, fucking edge over, and next thing you know, oh, here comes the save, and it's Daniel Garcia and some guy. All right, cool. Uh, but yeah, they had handcuffs with them, and they did hit. Oh, there was a cool spot too where uh, Edge hit the Impaler DDT on Kill Switch onto the barbed wire chair, so they did end up using that as a spot at least. Uh, but yeah, the match finishes with. Uh, you know, they handcuff Christian kill switch and the other Wayne Brady kid in the corners and uh, edge hits him with uh, a kick to the balls, uh, you know, going back to, you know, the thing that uh, Christian did to him and then just hits him with repeated nut shots, which honestly like just looks brutal. So yeah, edge has, Outsmarted Christian has him handcuffed. He's hitting him with the repeated nut shots, and then he goes and gets spike his his little spiky club, uh, and he hits Christian in the nuts with it. And still, he won't give up. Uh, so he's gonna hit him in the head, and then right before he does, Christian finally says, "Okay, I'm gonna save my face here," and calls it quits. Uh, Edge wins. The AEW TNT title. Man, it's too many letters. Uh, but yeah, I loved the match. I loved uh, this as like the end to ramp uh, to Dynamite. Sorry, and then we saw the callback of it on Rampage because um, you saw the best friends after their match. They were celebrating with Edge, so I thought that was kind of a cool little spot way to tie the two shows together. But yeah, overall. Really enjoyed uh, the experience of uh, watching the Toronto shows. And I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, there's a couple London shows coming up. There's the Quebec City show that I'm excited for. You know, I love watching Canadian wrestling shows. So uh, definitely a little bit of a homer and I'm definitely biased. But, hey, the crowds always make it fun. And so I'll usually watch any kind of wrestling coming out of Canada. That's it for me today. We're going to wrap it up. With no fan questions, unfortunately. But that's because I've been making them up. And if you guys want fan questions back on the show, it's up to you out there to send in some fan questions. So, hey, please send some fan questions. Hit me up on Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, at Jack Lucene. Drop some in the comments, even. I'll I'll take them from there. Or if you want something more low-key, you can always send emails, too, to worstsportschannel at gmail.com. That's it for me, and I will catch all of you guys on the flip side.
My positive contact results in affirmative impact. Never vulgarize on raps. I'm never primitive, but then I'm ballistic, vicious, characteristics. I read the terror potency, empathetic genes, yo. Empathy each I'm seized at extraordinary speed. Some of the is like some of the razor blades and grease in your bare feet. I see your fucking colleagues misprize you very much to your dismay. So today, I can say you won't be running away. Hold your tail between your legs. I'm gonna advocate when you fail with low stakes. I'll take a hacksaw to you, cockeyed, mumble rap, slack jaws. Leave be shredded on a side like some coleslaw. The double time with that clothesline from hell like Bradshaw. I'm toxic like septic shot. A dying breed like anorexic dogs.